Hello, my name is Johnny, and I'm one of the pastors here at Calvary. And I'm just thankful for the opportunity to step into this series uh, that you guys have been in uh, for the entire year so far, uh, the academic year, um, through Psalm 119. I think it is just such a great idea. When Pam uh, first presented it to me, I was super excited about it for you all. I think it's such a great opportunity to take a journey through just one chapter of the Bible uh, for an entire academic year. And I just think it um, brings out things that you wouldn't maybe otherwise see as you slowly kind of go through the chapter. And uh, I hope you guys have been able to kind of access all the resources uh, that Pam has put out for, for you all, both the book, obviously, and uh, I've really enjoyed reading through that. I haven't read, read every chapter uh, up to this point, but I've read a number of them, and also um, the teachings that have been posted each week. I've been able to also watch a few of those, and between the two of them are just such fantastic resources for you all as you uh, kind of take this journey through Psalm 119 this year. And so again, I hope you are, are feeling encouraged and um, growing in your knowledge of uh, Scripture and just also very practically uh, growing in and learning what it means to live life before God. In the end of the day, that's what the Psalms are. And so that's what I want to kind of go, before we kind of get into the section uh, that we are today, Psalm, uh, Psalm 119, verses 105 through 112, I want to just make two uh, observations uh, before we get into that section of verses that kind of shape not just this particular section, but just a way of viewing all of the Psalms, and I think that are, uh, are important. Um, the first one is uh, maybe... Um, obvious, but I think when you go through something like Psalm 119 for an entire year, I think sometimes you can, when you kind of get into the weeds, you kind of lose focus uh, and the, and lose a bigger picture at times. That's the temptation, uh, potentially. And so, one of the things I just want to remind you all is that the Psalms are a prayer, a book of prayer, and it's meant to be our life before God. Um, I think sometimes we can think of prayer um, as a discipline to feel bad about if we don't do it enough. How many of you uh, can sympathize with that feeling? That we oftentimes think of prayer as simply a spiritual discipline that we feel bad about when we don't do it enough. And we totally lose sight of what the whole purpose of prayer actually is for us and our relationship with God. So the first point I want to make that's kind of obvious is that remember this is a prayer book and so then what is prayer? Prayer is a way to communicate about our life with God. It's to live life with God, to live life before God. And it gives us voices to understand what kind of voices we can have before God, whether it's doubt or lament or thanksgiving or praise. But I think it's really important to understand that it's in response to what life is dealing you, whether in the past or whether it's in the present or whether it's something you're concerned about in the future. All of those concerns, whether the response is um, concern or doubt or fear, or whether the response is joy, both ways to go before God. And that's what prayer is. And the Psalms reveal that for us. Uh, all of the psalmists uh, at some point went through hardship. And, and actually the author for uh, this chapter, chapter 19 uh, of the book, brought this up. She highlighted the fact that all of us have some experience with life in a valley. Obviously, valley is the analogy of going through suffering or affliction. Um, and she made this point that um, all of us um, are either in the valley um, presently or looking maybe back to a valley experience in life or maybe unknowingly walking toward a valley. But all of us have connection with suffering and affliction in some way or sorrow in some way. 
um, all of us as human beings in life uh, go through a variety of challenges uh, in different ways uh, to be sure. Not all of us have the same challenges. Not all of us have the same afflictions uh, and, and situations in our lives. But the reality is being bro uh, brought into this broken world, all of us are either on our way to a valley, if we've never had a serious valley moment in our life, maybe we're in the valley, or maybe we went through a valley and are looking back on it. But all of those are meant not to be disconnected from our life with God, as if the valley is a bad thing and we shouldn't bring that before God. Our interaction with valley seasons bring out a range of emotions, and these range of emotions are meant to be brought before God. And that's what prayer is. And I think it's just really important to, to be reminded that that's what prayer is. Um, many of us grew up in different kinds of families. Maybe the tough emotions of life were told to be stuffed and, and not uh, expressed. And so some of us uh, have history with stuffing our emotions, pretending that they're not there. Or maybe it's the opposite. Maybe some of us uh, grew up in homes where all the emotions <laughs> came out. Um, and whenever there was a frustration or a struggle or whatever it was, it was, you know, everyone in the house heard about all the struggles because we were a very vocal um, family. And, and, and many families uh, are there on that spectrum at some level, right? Um, and what is really cool about remembering this idea that the Psalms uh, and are meant to guide us in our prayer life, our communication with God, is that I actually think prayer becomes something in between the two, or not, not stuffing the emotions, maybe not just releasing the emotions or letting them control us, but it's taking the reality of those emotions before God in relation to, to the struggles that we're going through. And we see that in our section, uh, verses 105 to 112, uh, no doubt. Um, and so I think it's just a good reminder as we think about Psalms as a whole to remember as we're going through it, we're not just trying to analyze literary information. But the literary information that we are looking at is a prayer. It's a real life wrapped up in a real story with real struggles and expressing that before God. Expressing maybe the frustration of the current situation, but then also expressing hope that God will deliver. And I think that's really important and it should be the same model for us. Um, it's, it gives us a way to not stuff our emotions. We're actually supposed to take them to God. He doesn't want us to stuff them, but he wants us to take them to him. But he doesn't want the emotions necessarily to fully control us in negative ways. He wants us um, to find peace in him, even in the midst of the struggle, which is obviously incredibly hard. But that's what um, the Psalms are. It's a book of prayers of living life before God. It is not just simply a discipline to be disappointed in ourselves about if we, if we, if we. And so I just think that's really important to remember as we go into uh, this section and, and maybe a helpful reminder as you continue on in the series. The second thing I want to talk about uh, by way of just some background is the context of the Psalms. Where do the Psalms come in to this Old Testament story? It's really important. You can see it through two themes. You can really see it in the, the two themes that are brought out in the first two Psalms, Psalm 1, Psalm 2. Psalm 1 really highlights this idea of meditation on the law. And then Psalm 2 really emphasizes this idea of a Messiah that is going to be the true deliverer for Israel. So first, when you look at the very first uh, Psalm, Psalm 1, blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. That is the vision of the Psalms, is that you are someone who meditates 
consistently on uh, the law of the Lord. And when you do that, you are like a tree that is planted by a, a very live a body of water. And so you produce much good fruit. And that's the kind of person um, that is projected for the Psalms. But remember, when we hear the word law, we can very much think uh, in, in our kind of modern way of looking at law as if law are just a list from one to whatever of do this, don't do that, do this, don't do that. That's definitely not um, primarily what is being referred to by all of the psalmists when they talk about the law of the Lord. They're not thinking, it's not, it's not as if the psalmists are all the kind of personality that just has to check a list off and to feel you know, value and to feel good. Uh, that's, that's not what's being said. It's not as if the psalmist says that we love all the details of these law, or there's some legal expert that just loves all the minutia of legislation. Um, when it's referring to the law of the Lord, it actually does encompass laws and, and does have quite a few details about some laws. There's no doubt that that's a piece of it. But the phrase, the law of the Lord, has a much broader um, reality that it's encompassing. And that is to think of it in terms of the whole first five books of the Bible, what we call the Torah. The whole Torah, the whole story of Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. That is the shaping story that guided the people of Israel. And so that's when, he, when, when, when the psalmists are saying, when King David is saying, I meditate on your law, I love your law. What it's saying is that God has revealed himself to us. And we love that he's done it through our lives. The story of our lives as a nation, Israel. And it is on these stories that I love to. How many of you guys have like, you know, your like top one or two books that you've read and the story, and you just love reading the story. You get lost in the story. That's what it, we should be thinking of when we think of the psalmist saying they delight in the law of the Lord. Not so much about checking a list or, or uh, debating finer um, nuances of legislation. But when you read the psalmist saying, delighting in the law of the Lord, or loving the law of the Lord, you should imagine them getting lost into an amazing story. That's the idea of the law of the Lord and the beauty of the law of the Lord and the instruction that is found and uh, the liberation that is found in that story. Because we have to remember that the first five books of the Bible, what are they fundamentally telling us? They're fundamentally telling us that the Creator God created a world and human beings self-destructed. But God is going to fix that world. And that self-destruction had terrible, terrible effect on the entire creation. But the Creator God is going to fix the world. How is He going to do it? He's chosen a family. He's made a covenant with a family, the family of Abraham, and said, through your family, Abraham, I'm going to fix all of creation. I'm going to make everything new again. And this is a crucial part of it. And as we see um, in chapter 2, what's interesting is you go from this meditation on the law of the Lord and the kind of person that does that, what they're like, and then it goes right into why do the nations rage and the people's plot in vain and the kings. And it goes all, all of a sudden into this royal language. Um, it says, he who sits in the heavens laughs. It talks about like God sitting in Zion on a throne. Um, and then it has this um, picture of actually the final Messiah in verse 7. The Lord said to me, you are my son, today I have begotten you. Ask of me and I will make the nations your heritage and the ends of the earth your possession. So there's going to be this king that's going to possess the entire creation. And then it ends uh, with kiss the sun. So all this royal legal language, or sorry, royal language, not legal language, royal language. And so it's really important to the entire book of the Psalms, all 150 of them are two things. The story of Torah 
is the kind of story to get lost in and to find life in because God reveals himself to his to us as his people in one and two the family of Abraham is going to have a king come from that family that is going to be the primary person through whom God is going to fix the world. And so this is really important. I know I've, I've shared a lot, um, but I just think it's really important to understand all that as we go into them. One, it's a prayer. It's a prayer in current struggles. The other thing um, is that it's the two main themes I run throughout the entire psalm. Uh, books, uh, the entire book of Psalms um, is the idea of the law of the Lord and what all that encompasses and to that there's this king figure that's going to be the means and the main person through which God fixes this uh, world. And, and so anyways, just, just hopefully that's helpful uh, background as we think about uh, Psalm 119. All of that, I think, actually is found. Um, so those two themes, um, what I kind of use as background, I actually kind of use it as background because we find them also in this specific section, not just in the chapter, but even in this section. So let me read for us um, our section uh, for this week, and that is Psalm 119, verses 105 through 112. Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. I have sworn an oath and confirmed it to keep your righteous rules. I am severely afflicted. Give me life, O Lord, according to your word. Accept my free will offerings of praise, O Lord, and teach me your rules. I hold my life in my hand continually, but I do not forget your law. The wicked have laid a snare for me, but I do not stray from your precepts. Your testimonies are my heritage forever, for they are the joy of my heart. Incline my heart to perform your statutes forever to the end. All right, I just want to make a few um, highlights here um, in this section, and then we'll be done. Um, the first thing is to understand uh, we come across one of the most popular verses not only like in the Psalm one in Psalm one nineteen, but all the Psalms and in some ways all of the Bible, and that is the very first verse we I read Psalm one nineteen and verse one hundred and five. Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. Now, I want to go back to what I said earlier about what prayer is and, and what what is meant by the law of the Lord, um, in your word. Remember, it's referring to this larger reality of the Torah, the story of the Torah. So you could read this as the story of God's relationship with Israel is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. And why is that? Why does the psalmist need the stories of Torah to be a lamp for his feet and a light for his path. Why? Look two verses down. I am severely afflicted. What was the one thing I said earlier that all of us as human beings have some kind of connection to valleys, right? And here the psalmist is saying, I am severely afflicted. And so how does the psalmist find encouragement? How does he find guy going forward. The psalmist is in a current situation of affliction. Maybe you're in the valley right now. Maybe you can see the valley coming. Maybe you've already been through the valley in the past. So what would you do when you're severely afflicted? Where do you look for, what do you look for? Where do you look to go when you are in affliction or when you are in the valley? Well, the psalmist says, the stories of Torah are the light for my path. And what does he mean by that? He says, I can read about the people of God that have gone before me and see that they've also been through trials. They've also been through trials. And God brought them through it. God was with them even in the midst of the trial. God never left them during the trials, during the suffering, 
And so that is what's, I think, going on here for the psalmist is, why does he need the Word of God, the instruction of God, the Torah? Why does, God, why does he need it? Why does he need to have it as a guide for him in life? Not so he can say, I know I'm supposed to keep all these laws, and I want to be able to go to you, God, and say I kept all the laws. So thank you for clarifying which laws I should keep. No, it's not just so he could check a list. It's because he was really going through an affliction. He was really struggling, and he had real doubts and questions. But as he was able to get swept up into this past story of how God had made promises and covenants, he was able to see people that struggled like he struggled, and he was able to see God stay with them through their struggles and stay faithful to his promises. And so the same for us. When we read the Bible, so we, when we read here um, that God's word is a light to our path, or in the first psalm, um, that we uh, meditate on the law of the Lord, or as we see here that his testimonies are a joy to my heart. Why? Because in that moment where we feel isolated and all alone in affliction, it's a bad place to feel alone in suffering. But when he goes back and meditates on the story of the first five books of the Bible, he realizes all of a sudden he's in community now with other people who have struggled. And so now the Psalms are telling us that in the midst of our struggles, go back to the story of the Bible and find solidarity with people who struggle, maybe like you struggle. Go back and find that solidarity and see a God who remains faithfully present, who will never leave you nor forsake you. I mean, that is what Jesus ultimately is to us. God's clearest expression that he will never leave us nor forsake us. And that can't be any clearer than the person of Jesus. And so in our afflictions, let's go to the story of the Bible, not just as a list of laws, but a story of how God works with people just like us and gets swept up in it, even in the midst of our affliction. And that we can communicate the struggle to God. God wants to hear from us about our afflictions and our struggles and our doubts. That is precisely the place to go. The other thing I wanted to highlight, and then I'm almost done here, is, which is in connection in many ways to what's already been stated here in verse 111. Your testimonies are my heritage forever. I love that idea that the testimonies are, again, the law of the Lord, the testimonies, the precepts, uh, the Torah, the story of the Bible. Uh, the psalmist here says, are their heritage Think of heritage, and this was brought out by the author in chapter 19 in reflection on this section. What is your heritage? What is your family lineage? What's the story of your family, your parents, your grandparents? And, he's, and the psalmist says, which is interesting because in, in many ways, that's not our, let's say, biological heritage. But there's a covenantal heritage that we have been brought into through Jesus. Jesus is the promised Messiah to fix the world that is talked about in Psalm 2. And Jesus was of this family line of Abraham. And we are engrafted into that family lineage through Jesus so that while it's not our maybe DNA or biological heritage if we're not Jews, um, it is our covenantal heritage. We've been brought into this covenant. We've been engrafted into this covenant. As Romans 11 talks about being engrafted into the covenant family of God. And so in a way, it becomes our heritage. And so think about some of you may find uh, family heritage either can bring um, a lot of concern or hurt or interest, or it can bring all sorts of emotions when we think about the lineage of our families, right? And we have a lot of reactions to it sometimes. But we also have this covenantal family, and it should evoke similar emotions in us 
the family of Israel, the family of God, we are brought into through Jesus. And we should have the same connection to that heritage, actually, that this is the covenant of people through whom God is going to restore all the creation. And we are engrafted into that covenantal family. And so the psalmist, when the psalmist says, the story of Torah, your testimonies, the story of Torah are my heritage forever, we can say the same. But the story of the Bible, about how God is going about restoring creation is our heritage forever. And we can find within that, and I'm gonna kind of repeat what I've said earlier, is people that have struggled, people that have had doubt, people that have had fear, people that have had joy, people that have had love, all the range of experiences of the human experience they had. And they were, through the example of the psalmists, encouraged to express those very both just for lack of better categorizations, positive or negative emotions, um, encouraged to bring those before God and to step into the story of what God is doing in the world to restore, to forgive, and to redeem. So I hope this has been just kind of a helpful reflection on this section as we think about um, not just the Psalms in terms of them being interesting literary poetry, which they are, but also real prayers from real human beings who went through real struggles and lived powerful lives before God. And they found in the story of Scripture, they found in the stories of Torah, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, an amazing creator God who was not only transcendent and majestic, but near and close to those who call on him and trust in him. And so hope this section of the psalm um, can allow you space to think about your own struggles, suffering you've been through or you're going through, and to find solidarity in the stories of struggles like recorded in the Bible that just as God was faithful to them, he will be faithful to you. All right. Well, let me close in prayer and I'll be done. Thank you again for this opportunity. And um, as always, feel free to reach out. If you have any questions, you can find my email address on the website at calvinworld.com. We'll be more than happy to follow up with anyone that has questions. Let me pray. Father, thank you for your mercy and your grace. Thank you for your compassion. Thank you that you are compassionate and gracious, slow to anger and overflowing in love and faithfulness. May we continue to trust and follow you even in the midst of our afflictions. We pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Thank you again. Goodbye.